Hi everyone, and welcome to this session as part of Lifelong Learning Week by Career Map. I'm Eloise, I'm from Career Map. Um, maybe you recognize some of you from other events in the past. And this session is with Pearson, and we're going to be talking about returning to learning, how higher technical education can support your career aspirations. And so we'll have Rebecca, Tom, and Paul on from Pearson in a moment. But first, um, this session will be recorded. So if you have any questions or things that you want to return to at the end, um, don't worry, you will have the recording and you also have all of the links that you need to go and find out further information for. Um, if you have questions, type them in the chat. You can also introduce yourself in the chat if you want. Tell everyone where you're from, um, why you're interested in the session, things like that. You can just drop that in the chat or you can use the Q&A function if you have specific questions. Um, we'll keep an eye on those throughout and then there will be also an opportunity to get all of your questions answered at the end. Um, if you have any technical issues or if anything is um, you can't hear us, you can't see us or anything like that, drop that in the chat as well and I'll keep an eye on that and try and fix it for you. Um, other than that, I think that is all from me. So I will hand over to the Pearson team to tell you more about this session. Hi everyone, good morning. And thank you very much, Eloise, for introducing us today. So we're really um, happy to be here today and to welcome you all to today's session. My name is Rebecca Mamelli, and I'm the Strategic Lead for Higher Education Research and Qualifications at Pearson. And I'm really pleased to be joined by Paul Rolf, who's Associate Principal Employers and Stakeholders at the Chichester College Group, as well as being the Director of the Sussex and Surrey Institute of Technology. We're also really delighted to have Tom Tyshurst here with us today. Tom is a student, a real life student, studying a higher national diploma in cloud computing at Chichester College. So our session today is going to focus on higher technical education. What is it? Why is it a great choice? Where it can take you and what it's really like to do this type of learning. And as Eloise said, there'll be plenty of time for questions in the sort of second half of today's session. But please do pop your questions, discussions, whatever it is you'd like to learn. Do start popping that in the chat. So I'd like to start by thinking a little bit, bit about what is higher technical education. Some of you may know, some of you may be a bit baffled by the, the phrase. So generally speaking, higher technical education is studied by those who are over 18. So this is post-secondary school study. And in fact, over half of those studying higher technical qualifications are actually over 25. Um, that's in England. So there's a really good, strong adult market for this type of learning, a very, very broad spread, uh, spread of ages taking high, um, this type of study. So higher technical education is, of course, higher education, and it's usually at a similar educational level to the first two years of an undergraduate degree. Um, sometimes that's known as level four and level five, and you, you'll sometimes hear this type of learning referred to by level. But broadly speaking, it's the first two years of that undergraduate degree. So a really good example of this type of education is the higher nationals. And they take the form of the higher national certificate and the higher national diploma. Now, there are other types of qualifications in this space, but we're going to focus today on the higher nationals. So courses of this type are very career focused. They're built with employer input to ensure that everyone completing them is on the path to a career or if they're already in a career that this is going to support them in their career progression and upskilling or learning new skills. It's also worth knowing that there's been quite a lot of focus of late in England specifically on this type of education, on higher technical. So the Department for Education at the moment is investing a lot into higher technical education as part of a commitment to improving and diversifying routes into skilled employment and also access to higher education. So why is it a great choice? Why is higher technical education a great choice? I'd like to give an example to illustrate this. So on the slide there, you can see Chris Meredith. Now, Chris was the 2019 BTEC Student of the Year and also uh, the Apprentice of the Year for the same year. And there he is receiving his awards. Chris's story is really inspiring. He completed a higher national certificate and a higher national diploma 
in civil engineering at Leeds College of Building. So he did his full journey, his high national journey at that institution. And as a result of um, doing that study, he was able to progress on. And at the moment, he works for Jacobs Engineering, where he's involved in the technical design of highways and he uses 3D visualization models and drawings to do this. He works with project teams all over the world and is really instrumental in solving complex civil engineering problems for the company he works for. So I, I love this story. It's a really fantastic outcome for Chris and an example of where higher technical study can take you. There are also some studies that have been done to look at the earning benefits of, for students who take higher technical education. And one of these studies found that on average salaries of those who did a level five course, so sort of equivalent to a higher national diploma, were 30% higher than if they had completed a foundation degree and 18% higher than if they'd completed a degree. And obviously this depends on the sector that you're in, but that there are these potential earning benefits for taking these types of qualifications. I'm going to tell you a bit more now about the higher nationals, what they are and, and what they can do. So Pearson, which is where I work, um, design, develop and promote these qualifications. And we have done for many years. We really believe in their in their value for students. They are globally recognised qualifications. And in fact, they're delivered in over 50 countries worldwide. And we have over 50,000 registered learners worldwide every year. They are designed to provide routes into and through employment. And to make sure this happens, we work very closely with employers, with professional bodies, with students themselves, with providers of higher ed technical education and many others to ensure that we are putting the right con content and assessment into the qualifications to ensure the outcomes that students want. So entering employment, progressing in study, etc. That's really important to us. The main places you can study in the UK include further education colleges, some private colleges, some universities of higher nationals, and of course, the new institutes of technology. So these are new institutes that have been set up by the government specifically to deliver higher technical education. And you're going to hear more about this in, in Paul's section of the session coming up in a bit. So in short, the higher nationals are very well respected examples of higher technical education, and they could be a great choice for you if you're looking for a career focused course. They are also student loan funded in England, which means in the same way that you can get funding for a degree, you can get funding to complete a higher national. I'd like to talk a little now about the variety of subjects that the higher nationals are available in. So you can see there's an extremely broad range of available subject areas. Some of our most popular and well-known are in engineering and construction, um, digital and business. So what might, one might refer to as uh, STEM, so tech, very technical areas, but it doesn't stop there because we do have uh, high nationals available in a, in a broader range of subjects from performing arts to music, all the way through to travel and tourism, hospitality, and um, early years and also of course health so th there should really be something for everyone i would i would think within that and when we when we're designing the qualifications we don't just think about subject we think about job role so i'll just call out a few of the types of job role that we've been looking at recently in our development of qualifications so business analyst data analyst software tester cyber security technologist construction site supervisor, engineering manufacturing technician, music producer, the list goes on. But this just to give you a taste of some of the, you know, if any of those uh, job titles ring a bell with you or, you know, they pique your interest, those are the kinds of things that you could hope to progress to after completing a higher national. Accessibility and flexibility are absolutely central for, for us. We believe that higher education, any education should be accessible to, to everybody and that, that the study should fit around your life, not, not the other way around really. So in terms of how you can join or get onto a higher national programme, there's an extremely wide range of routes into that. Some students come from um, a level three vocational qualification. 
some from A-levels, some from access to higher ed diplomas, some students come from totally alternative educational background um, and find their way to the course in, in other ways. And their um, total skills profile is looked at as part of the recruitment process. So it's very accessible and, and um, you know, there's a broad kind of entry criteria really to support people entering courses, broad but robust. Once you're on the course, there are, there are very, lots of different models of delivery. One of them is that some students that are employed actually while they study the higher national, that's quite that's quite common, particularly the higher national certificate. And there are part time study models that can support that. So you can work and you can study at the same time. And in fact, higher nationals are often part of higher apprenticeship programs as well. The higher national is designed in such a way that the, the two qualifications, the higher national certificate and diploma are linked so the higher national certificate is nested in the higher national diploma so it's possible to jump off if you complete your first year let's say of study and you think right well i've got my hnc now i want to stop i've got other things i want to do you can bank that you can certificate and then you can come back possibly at a later date to top up your study if that's something that you want to do so that is always a, an open option for you and last but not least, once you've completed either your HNC or your HND study, you can think about entering a career if you're not already in one or, or even progressing to university. So one of the interesting features of the higher nationals is that after completing an HND, the, the two year higher national diploma, many universities will accept students onto the final year of a degree. Now, that's not necessary or desirable for everybody, but in some sectors that might be important. For you personally, that might be important. So we've built the qualifications in such a way that we smooth that route up to the final year of degree. And we work with universities to really cement those progression routes for students. We have a list of those universities that we work with. We work very hard to ensure that the higher nationals have value for student outcomes. And I think I've, I've said quite a lot about that, but I just want to call out some examples of of how we, we do that. So one way we do that is by working very closely with professional bodies as we design, develop and launch and support higher national students and providers. So we work with professional bodies in lots of different ways. And one of the main ones is we make sure that their professional standards are built into our higher national programs. So that as you study a higher national, you are studying an industry standard, professional standard of qualification in terms of what you're learning and what you're being assessed on. And in fact, what that can lead to once you've completed the higher national is that it can be easier for you to enter a professional body and gain professional status. You may be exempt from certain professional qualifications and exams as, how, as your study of the higher national has kind of covered that already. And at the very least, the professional body will recognize the course that you've done, whatever relationship you end up having with them. So there are lots of bodies we work with. I've just picked out a few examples on the slide there. So we've got the Digital Marketing Institute, it's quite a new partner for us. The Chartered Institute of Building, very important in our construction portfolio. And let's pick one more, the, the British Computing Society. So you can see there's some key names there, um, but really this is something we aim to do in every higher national that we build. Uh, last but not least, I want to talk a little bit more about recognition by industry. And in the same way as for the professional bodies, we work with industry and employers to make sure that we are building in what an employer expects a, a, a graduate to know, be able to do, how, to, how they want them to behave when they come to enter the workplace. So our relationship with employers is vitally important to, to make sure the qualifications are really doing their job. And also that so that employers can understand what a higher national is when they see a graduate with that qualification. So you can imagine we do a great deal of work with uh, lots of very big employers. And again, I picked out some, some what I think are good examples on this slide. We've got BMW, that's part of our engineering manufacturing operations portfolio for higher nationals. Tata Steel, we've got CompTIA, that's a, a computing a digital organization, BT. And the last one I'll mention is Amazon Web Service Services. So this is a really great partnership we had. We have um, Amazon Web Services and Pearson developed a, a higher national in cloud computing. And we really came together 
to recognize that, that we're going to need um, globally lots and lots of skilled cloud engineers in years to come, given you know technological advancement. So we worked really closely with AWS to, to find out from them, what do people need to know to do, how to behave to, to be this, this person, to have this career. And we built the higher national accordingly. And I'm actually delighted to say that um, Tom, who's the student on the call today, Tom is actually studying on this qualification. So hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about the reality of that experience from him. So I'm going to stop there and I'm now going to hand over to Paul, who's going to hopefully bring all of this to life for you uh, with a talk about what's happening at the Sussex and Surrey Institute of Technology. So over to you, Paul. Thanks, Rebecca. Hopefully you can see my presentation. So um, just to uh, reiterate to what Rebecca said earlier, I've, I've been reading the questions people have been posting in the chat. Uh, we will come back to those um, very shortly after I've spoken to, and, and, and our, our students spoken as well. So continue to do post your your questions in the chat. So um, my name is Paul Rolf. I'm the associate principal for employers and stakeholders for the Tichita College Group, uh, but I also have another role, and that is Director of the Sussex and Surrey Institute of Technology. So I'm going to take you through what Institutes of Technologies are, and that they're, they're relatively new into the market, and they, they sit between colleges and universities. So basically, they're a collaboration between further education colleges, universities, and uh, importantly, employers. And I think that's what makes this truly unique and really exciting value proposition. They specialise in delivering higher technical education, uh, as, as Rebecca said, which is at level four and five, with a focus on STEM subjects, which is science, technology, engineering and maths. So, what, what are the benefits? So my role takes me working with a huge range of employers across Sussex, Hampshire and Surrey. And what I hear from employers on a daily basis is that they need more higher level technical qualified uh, employees. And this is what the IOT is directly there to address. With it, we're really keen to widen participation into higher education. So what that means is that attracting people that who wouldn't normally have considered themselves as going into universities. A lot of people think maybe they're not quite good enough. Maybe they think it's not the right environment for them. Lots of different reasons why people put off or choose not to study um, at, um, at university. One of the things I should have mentioned as well is what I was a lecturer teaching um, on the business HND and the computing HND a good few years ago. And the students that I found excel the most were those that hadn't normally thought of themselves of going into higher education. So if you're on this call today and you're umming and ahhing, I, I strongly recommend you do consider this as an option. IOTs are a deep collaboration with employers. So that means that if you go and study at an IOT, we have employers working with us already, so you have those strong uh, routes to go into employment. We also have things called progression agreements with universities, which means that if you do uh, do a HNC or HND, there is a progression agreement in place that if you pass, you can go straight in uh, to university and get your degree qualification. So, for the Sussex and Surrey Institute of Technology, um, as, as I mentioned, it's a collaboration between further education and higher education. So our Institute of Technology is a collaboration between uh, Chichester College Group, who I work for, um, Nescot, who are based in Surrey, and the University of Sussex and the University of Brighton. So all institutes of technology have this collaboration between further education and higher education. Like all institutes, we have employer partners. So really proud to have Rebecca and Pearson, who are one of our, our, our key stakeholders. And we're working really closely with these employers to redefine, redesign qualifications. So it's not just what we teach, it's how we teach it as well. 
I'm very, very passionate to be making sure that we deliver qualifications for now and in the future, making sure we deliver them in a way that is flexible. And in that, I mean um, taking a blended approach to learning. So that is coming into college to learn, coming into university to learn, going into an employer and learn, and maybe some online learning as well. So there was a question earlier I read in the chat about whether these qualifications are delivered wholly online or wholly in classroom. It, it totally depends on the provider. I'm a firm believer that a blended solution tends to work well. So a lot of our, 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 our qualifications have a blended approach. The other important thing I really want to stipulate at this time, again, is another thing I'm very passionate about, is assessment methods. So uh, these programmes have really flexible assessment methods. So it's not just about writing reports and essays. Really want to just to, to, to press that home because writing reports and essays aren't everyone's strong point. So there's a complete range of assessment methods on these programmes from producing portfolios, from having recorded professional discussions, from doing videos, from posters, a whole, whole range that play to uh, candidate strengths. So moving on to my next slide here, um, there are a huge range of the network of IOTs available around the country. So you can see those marked in orange. They're the ones that are available and active now. So you can have a little look to see if there's any in your region. And those that are in blue are currently in development and will be coming on stream in September 2023. So the one that I'm part of is Q down there on the south coast and we start delivery in September 2023. So in terms of our curriculum, um, what we've done is we've worked with employers, which all IOTs do locally and regionally, to be making sure we're putting on programmes that are in the skills gap areas. So we focused on an IOT on three areas. Uh, they are digital, engineering and advanced manufacturing, and technical construction. So that's kind of white collar um, technical construction role. So there are three priorities. And then we have three cross cutting themes based on priorities locally. So one is med tech. So that's how technology is being used to treat illness and also prevent illness. And we're working with some great companies on that. Uh, financial technology, FinTech, so how technology is disrupting the uh, financial sector. And then finally, environmental technologies, which are a huge, huge priority for the, for the nation. Uh, I, I have the pleasure of sitting on the government's Green Skills uh, Committee, a uh, ministerial committee at the moment, working with a whole range of huge, uh, large providers. And this is a huge priority for them. So it, it, it's a career well worth looking at. What we're keen to do as well is to make sure all of our qualifications uh, take on board um, key skills areas. So things like data analytics, big data, artificial reality and virtual reality, the Internet of Things, cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. So all of our programmes have units that um, take on board those different elements as well, making sure we're preparing people for the that uh, be the workforce of the future. That was my kind of quick run through on Institutes of Technology. I just wanted to, to leave my contact details there for anybody that might need them. Um, I'm happy to connect anyone with any other Institutes of Technology. I'm happy to answer any questions. So if anybody doesn't feel confident about putting a chat question in today, please do reach out to me. Um, I work with a whole range of universities and colleges across the country, and I'm more than happy to um, answer any questions uh, that I can. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Uh, sorry, not Tom, sorry, Paul, thank you. That was brilliant. Um, I think we do have some questions actually specifically relating to your, your session, but if people don't mind, we will leave that just for a moment while we speak to Tom Ticehurst, who is our student here today. So Tom, are you, are you with us? Hi, yeah, thank Hi, you. Tom. Hi, well, welcome. So we're going to talk to Tom now about what it's really like to study higher technical education uh, and, a, and a bit on why he chose this, this type of study. So first, first of all, Tom, can you tell us a bit more about the course you're studying? 
So as it was previously mentioned, it's on um, cybersecurity and cloud computing. So that uh, means sort of um, how like you're going to protect the system from threats. And then we also have units covering like accessing a system where like you shouldn't have access, sort of like hacking into it and sort of seeing like uh, where vulnerabilities arise in old versions and why you should upgrade programs. Um, that's sort of like an oversimplification of it, but I don't want to go into too much detail um, and sort of like um, like make it so people don't understand what it is, because when you're doing it, it's quite simple to understand, but um, like trying to explain it to someone else could be quite difficult because you don't want to go into too much detail and sort of like fry their brains at all. I think yes that, that would be me actually because I'm, I, I'm not very technologically minded I must say but I can recognize how important that particular field of study is for the modern world and the world that we live in today with all the cyber threats that um, various businesses and individuals encounter so it does sound like a fascinating field of study so actually this is great my next question was what made you choose the course and we do actually have a, a question in the chat from Thomas asking how you decided what you wanted to study so yeah would you like to answer that more for us yeah so um before um i chose this course i was doing a level three at Chichester college and it was sort of pointed out throughout the year that this was something we could go on to but so when it came to like writing personal statements and looking at ucas for courses um i kept this one in mind sort of looked at it compared to the other ones and in the end i decided to go to go with this one uh, mainly because of the curriculum and the fact that um, it focuses on like two main areas that are quite prevalent now um, in the industry like quite high demand and also mainly because uh, compared to actually going to university it, there's a lot less people so you get a lot more like one-to-one -one time if you're a tutor um, if you have if like if you're struggling or you have a question it's a lot easier you can just like put your hand up or just ask because I think there's only nine of us right now compared to like however many there have been in a, like, like a university setting. So that was sort of one of the main points. No, that's brilliant. And actually that level of, um, I guess, support and teacher time is fantastic, I imagine, to be in that sort of size of class. Yeah. So it's a really great benefit. Could you tell us a little bit more about what it's like studying on the course, the kind of best features for you? So. Probably one of the, like, the best features is, um, unlike like when university, it'd probably be mostly like written work and then a tiny bit workshop. Ours is mainly workshop. So throughout this whole um, like term, basically, uh, from when we started up until the Christmas holidays, we've been uh, working each lesson in like a workshop environment to develop our systems, which all sort of plays into an assignment because the assignment could have been um, all written if they'd wanted it to but it's quite nice to get some hands-on experience because it means if we ever have to do the same thing in the industry um, we don't just know the theory of it we know like the actual application how to fix problems because it's, ne it's never been smooth sailing every lesson there's always one issue but it's the sort of issue that you'd encounter and we sort of learn how to overcome it and sometimes just how to you know, ignore it and carry on because sometimes there's no way to solve it um, so we learned like which ones are safe to ignore which ones we actually need to like deal with and then um sort of how we go about doing them that's that's awesome so it's actually sort of re reflecting real life really because you know there aren't yeah. there isn't always an answer in a in a sort of working or any situation really and i love how practical and applied as a learning model that sounds my last question is where you want to go next and actually we peter in the chat has also asked what what job or career are you looking to get into after completing your qualifications so yeah let us know where you want to go next so i want to go into like penetration testing which is sort of uh, like taking a system seeing which areas you can gain access to it and then reporting back to your client um so sometimes it's done like they'll contact you and some like some of the companies that I've um, like researched about, um, like they'll get hired and then without telling the company, they'll try and gain access because penetration testing isn't just like uh, the digital side. There was one instance where someone just walked into a company who sat down and started working without anyone noticing. Um, so that's always sounded quite interesting to me because you get to 
like work out the flaws in the system and also like how it works um from like an outside perspective but like as a further thing um i've always sort of wanted like either like help start a company or start like a cyber security company because it's something that's in it, like interests me and while i want to like do a job i think it'd be quite nice to like um run it and be able to like specialize in a specific field so maybe specialize in like um, educational um, penetration testing and um, because they're normally quite wide scale systems so it's quite a specialist area rather than like a single company you've got like like Chichester College Group they've got all the campuses um, so if you want to test like the entire thing it's probably quite a large scale operation. That's fabulously interesting actually Tom and certainly education is you know the security levels have to be really really strong with dealing with personal information sometimes exam results you know it's a really important security issues there so yeah brilliant we do have a question from remy in the chat about what's been the most challenging thing about your course um probably adapting from going from a level three to an hnd because in the level three we'd have like word limits but they weren't strictly enforced uh, but now we sort of have n not like um, extremely strictly enforced, but like more strictly enforced word limits and more rules about the formatting. So rather than just opening up a document and starting typing, we have to take into consideration how we're going to format the document, um, make sure we have enough references and make sure it all sort of holds together. And also make sure we're like writing it in like a proper academic style, following all like the styles set in the assignment briefs rather than um just like shooting out ideas onto the page and then going back through and reformatting at the end no that's really that's really useful to know tom and i think you know when it comes to the world of work um there is that often a requirement to write something in a certain way or use a certain stylistic you know, whatever the company wants you to use or there might be specifications uh, that are technical and have to be written in a certain way so i think it's starting to prepare you for those kinds of requirements um, as you progress through your career uh, there's a question from Freya, but I, I think, Freya, that's probably one that we can all answer as a group. So if I, I just want to say thank you very much, Tom, for that. That was brilliant. And you really did bring it to life for me. I'm so pleased to see that there are students like you studying on the HN in cloud computing. Um, I think, Polly, sorry, I just saw that you, you've asked about career path. I think Tom was talking about penetration penetration testing as being an area that he was yeah. interested in going into so i think you may have answered that but like, to expand that a bit further after the first year of this once i've got the hnc i'm going to try and look for like a technical support job role to sort of like gain um like the first steps into going to the industry because it'll be quite nice to get some qualification get some experience in that because they're all skills you can transfer to a different company the communication and working with clients so I think it'd be quite good. Um, and I've started looking at like what I need to enter into that. That's amazing. And you, uh, you know, that's further opportunity to apply what you're learning in, in real life. So brilliant, brilliant idea. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Tom. So what I'd like to do now is go back to the bottom of the questions. We do, we have had a few coming through. So thank you very much for your engagement. And we'll try and answer as many as of them as we can now. Um, if Tom and Paul, you don't mind, I will either try and answer or nominate one of you or we'll do it all together. So <laughs> let's let's give it a go. So Dom has asked a question, first of all, what is higher technical education equivalent to? So Dom, um, you, generally speaking, it's equivalent, higher technical is level four and five, and that's generally equivalent to the first two years of a degree. So that's probably the best benchmark that I can give you. There are some professional qualifications in this space as well, but generally speaking, all qualifications developed are developed against certain level descriptors, which are set by the, the Ofqual, Ofqual's the regulator for qualifications and some of the higher education type frameworks as well. So they all tend to be at the same level, but first two years of an undergraduate degree is the nearest parallel. Rebecca, can I just come in here as yeah. well? So um, the HNC is the equivalent of a first year. Um, of a degree so what we have is quite a lot of students who will come and do the first year then have a year or two in industry 
then come back and study the HND part time and then go and do the, the, the top up. I think that's the beauty of these qualifications is that absolute flexibility. You could take them and do the HNC year one and the year two HND, then do the top up. So just like a, 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 um, a degree or you could stop off at any one of those points. Um, there is another product without trying to uh, confuse everybody. There's something called HN Flex as well. And that's where some providers offer units of a HNC or a HND, uh, which are accredited. So it means that you could just do one unit, see if you like it. And if it's something you want to do, you can then carry on. So there's lots of flexibility. And my advice, if you're interested, is talk to your local college or training provider. They, sh they, they should be able to provide you with advice and guidance. Thanks, Paul. That, that's a really helpful response, actually. And it, it sort of leads us on to Peter's question about are uh, is high technical or high nationals available to anyone who's already done a, de a degree? And yes, the answer is technically yes. But I think one of the challenges is possibly funding. And Paul, jump in if I'm if this has changed. But in my my memory, I think if you've already done a full degree, it's difficult to get the funding again for that. The alternative might be employer funding for your study. And the, the example that uh, Paul just gave of the HM Flex, that can be an employer funded type model. I'm not sure what your situation is, but I think, you know, with certainty, we can say, I don't think you can get your student loan again. Yes. So just, just building on that, Rebecca, my advice is, is to talk to your local college or university or training provider. They have expert people whose job it is to, to help support this. Now, just to, again, to elaborate on something Rebecca said earlier, some apprenticeships have HNCs and HNDs embedded in it. So you can do the apprenticeship and end up getting these qualifications. The great advantage of an apprenticeship is that they're for any age. They are not age specific. And the other great news is the employer pays the total cost. So there's no cost to the person doing the apprenticeship. Excellent points, Paul. And I think, yeah, the, the, the next step there is to talk to your the education provider that you're interested in, whether that's local or whoever that might be, because they'll be able to give you a wealth of information on the routes that you can take. Um, Thomas asks, are there many routes into STEM? Right. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure there are many. I mean, the, the experts for higher technical and technical, I think, are on this call, but I, I can't speak for... A level necessarily, or some of the other routes, but you know there are there's a wealth of ways in from apprenticeships to um, upskilling in the workplace without an apprenticeship to um, units of study, T levels of course, uh, just being coming online that the DfE and the government are are now launching very focused on STEM areas, existing vocational qualifications with things like engineering, construction, digital, so BTEC and many other types of vocational qualifications. So I think the short answer is there are many routes into STEM. Um, happy to chat, you know, offline or we, Paul, we've got these details, we can share mine as well, uh, if we can support you any more with your explorations there. Brianna asks, how much learning is done online now and have you been, and have you adapted to teaching or providing education online? Can I ask you, Paul, to have a, have a go at that one? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question, actually. Um, the, the answer to that is to do your research about the uh, training provider of choice. So there's huge flexibility in the market. So you'll have some providers who will do it completely online. Uh, and we know that a lot of learners love that flexibility. So there's that product out there with various different providers. There's the other end where it's completely coming into classroom in a, in a, in a supportive classroom environment, the kind of traditional approach. Um, and then there's in between where you get a, a mix of both. So in my experience, none of those are better or worse than another. It's entirely down to how you wish to study and the flexibility that you need. So the answer is do a bit of research um, with uh, the training providers around you and nationally. Thank you, Paul. Peter asks, which subjects are most popular and which do you think will be most valued by employers? Well, from the higher national perspective, business is very popular, digital and digital business, because there's crossover between all of these things. Engineering, very popular. Construction, very popular. Creative media is also quite popular. So you can see it's kind of um, leaning towards those more technical, future-facing skill sets. 
So that's really the perspective from the high national side, Paul. I, I think that probably chimes with the IoT experience. Yeah, I, I mean, I spend most of my days talking to employers and looking at labour market intelligence and data says that across the board, people are looking for uh, people with these technical skills. So I, I, I don't think one uh, area is better than another, to be honest with you. I think studying any any qualification at level four or five opens up opportunities. Um, I did my uh, qualifications in computing, so I, that was my my uh, undergrad degree. I uh, have since had two careers since then, so I've moved on. So uh, I, I don't think necessarily that picking one or the other is better than another or, or will pigeonhole you into future careers. Thank you for that, Paul. Just trying to find where we are in the questions. Ah, Freya, where can I find the entry requirements? So there are two places so in the actual qualification specification so Pearson publish the specification whenever they design a higher national and that would cover literally everything so what you're going to study how you're going to study it broadly speaking the assessment model the standards to which you'll be assessed and things like the general entry requirements for that qualification now the real entry requirements will be in the hands of the provider that you're applying to but we intentionally keep them reasonably broad, as I said, robust, but reasonably broad. So there's a range of people that could consider accessing the polls. But I, again, I would reach out to the providers that you're interested in um, going to and see what they, how they have set out those for their particular institutions. Yasmin asked, do you have any connections with employers to help find work after completing a qualification? We don't really do that centrally as such at Pearson, but we think that what we do do by engaging with employers so rigorously and thoroughly as we're designing qualifications and promoting them is to make sure is to really open the door um, so that the employers know who who we are, who what HNs are, what they can do, why they're good for why they get great graduates at the end of the day. So we don't sort of pro provide internships, let's say, but we do make sure there's maximum exposure to the type of qualification that you that you, you would be studying on. I think, Paul, it's probably a similar pitch for you in that you will involve employers massively, but it's not a question of funneling people into jobs at the end of the day. Yeah, well, as, as a large college group, we have a dedicated team who work with employers. So we receive hundreds of jobs that they um, advertise internally. We pass those on to students. Um, we have dedicated people to help with that. Um, we have people, obviously, part and a lot of trained providers have people to help with job interview skills, with CV skills, a whole range of support mechanisms to help people go into work. Um, I, I recently read our statistics, and 92% um, of learners last year who studied HNs with us went into work, which is a really high level uh, and, and a great statistic to champion. I'd like to point out that the others, uh, 8%, weren't necessarily looking for work. They might have gone into higher study or something. So <laughs> that's, that's still a staggeringly high percentage. So that's, that's fantastic to hear. So I think we've got a question from Jason on what the biggest, what is the biggest change in technology recently and how have you changed education to adapt? Brilliant question. So much going on in this space across the educational landscape. Um, of course, we've just been through COVID, which has really um, sort of sped everything up, I would say, from a technological perspective. Certainly not necessarily just the technology, but the way how open minded people are about distance learning, online learning, the flipped classroom. I don't know if that's a phrase you've ever heard, but that's when a student or a, a class will do most of their learning online. And that would be the more knowledge based. Uh, less practical and they'll come into the college or wherever for a day or, or two or whatever it is a week but less time and they will spend that time doing practical activities group work really applying what they've learned so we know that you know digital technology is really important to support that that model of learning and from the Pearson perspective we're just starting to look at some of the really exciting stuff in the metaverse around um, virtual reality. 
sort of virtual classrooms, bringing students together from all around the world to learn and um, engage with one another. So there'll be more to, to come on that, I should think, not just from Pearson, from very many different sort of ed tech companies. Paul, is there anything you want to, to say there? And of course, Tom, do jump in if there's anything you'd like to add. Yeah, so as training providers, we're constantly looking into the future to be able to making making sure we are training for the skills of the future. So when I talk about skills of the future, that's kind of horizon looking and uh, looking at what we need to be training people for. Um, we continuously invest in um, technology. Um, like most colleges do, and uh, Tom's probably seen the benefit of that recently. We've had uh, many thousands of pounds worth of investment coming into to the college. Um, so we, we're constantly teaching the cutting edge skills needed, but we're also teaching people to be able to adapt for the future because there are things that are going to happen that we can't predict right now. So how we take, uh, teach people to have the mindset to be able to tackle and cope with those changes in the future. So it's basically taking that kind of two pronged attack. I think we may be nearing the end of the, the session, which was 45 minutes. So I'll just quickly whiz through some of the final questions for you, Paul, um, which are quite practical ones, I think, about applying to the IOT. So we'll just go from the top. Graham, is there an age limit for applying? No. <laughs> great. That's great. Open to all. Do you need to submit your CV when you apply? No. So uh, there's quite a few questions on applying. Yes. So yeah. um, there's a, it's a bit confusing. So um, a number of providers use UCAS. So you can go onto UCAS and seek out these programmes. Um, you can also um, do some Google searching or you can go and visit your local college or training providers website. So that will give you the information, high level information about the course and the unit information. If you then apply, you, uh, the standard approach is that you're invited into an interview. And that is really important for you to go along because it's your opportunity to ask tough, probing questions about the course. It's a great opportunity to uh, visit the facilities and to talk to the lecturers about it. Um, once you've had the interview, you would then either be offered a, a place or a conditional place. By conditional place, it means that you have to pass um, your current qualifications to gain entry, um, and then you can then start the programme. Uh, the other thing I would suggest, and this is my tip, um, is don't be afraid. If you're still a bit nervous or unsure if it's the course for you, ask the provider if you could come and join one of the sessions free, just as a taster. Anyone, any provider who's kind of worth their salt will let you do that. And it'd be a great way for you to assess the environment, to, to, to you know, experience a real life uh, um, training session. Brilliant tip from the top there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how to get the most out of the application process. I think we are at time now um, for this session. I just want to say thank you so much, Tom, and thank you so much, Paul, for giving up some time today to talk to the group. I really hope people found that useful. Please do get in touch with us, um, you know, subsequent to this event if you need to know more. But I'll hand back over to you, Eloise. Oh, thank you so much. And um, yeah, no, really helpful. I feel like I learned a lot as well and loads of practical questions answered at the end there. And um, so Paul has just dropped his email in the chat very generously. He might get a lot of emails now. Um, so make sure you take that down um, before we close the session. But other than that, thank you so much, Paul, Rebecca, Tom, for talking us through the session. And I hope you all learned a lot. This is recorded. So if you, can, if you need to revisit anything, um, you can come back and find the recording. And we'll send out relevant links and things with the recording as well. Other than that, thank you so much. And um, yeah, hope you will have a great rest of your week. Thanks, all.